the nudes are always directly in front of those present at the Pope's Mass. One cannot, therefore, pray at the Pope's Mass without seeing Michelangelo's nudes. Despite the criticism, Michelangelo would persevere against all odds. Even when he fell from the scaffolding, he refused treatment. The last judgment was so close to his heart that he included himself among the resurrected in the flail skin of St. Bartholomew. He took revenge on the master of ceremonies who had complained about the nudity by consigning him to hell. One's first impression of The Last Judgment is just the confrontation of hundreds and hundreds of figures, but I think it's an extremely subtle and sophisticated organization, utilizing what is standard, the layering of the souls and the movement down on one side of the damned and the rising of the resurrected. All of his contemporaries recognize The Last Judgment to be one of the final statements of Michelangelo's art and of Catholic theology. The Sistine Chapel was now complete. From the creation to the apocalypse, Michelangelo had depicted the greatest story ever told at the very heart of Christendom. By now, he was in his 70s. His health was failing, but the reigning Pope, Paul III, had one last challenge for him. It was nothing less than building the new Rome a city that would surpass the glories of its classical past. Here we see the principles of architecture at work. Order, proportion, design, and style. Rome will be the better for it. Yes, Rome certainly was better off. In a sense, Michelangelo introduced cutting-edge, pioneering classical architecture to the city, an architecture which evokes the power, the memory of ancient Rome. Take the Campidoglio, for example. This was a, the political heart of Rome at the time, the hub of power. And here he created the city's first formal Renaissance piazza, quite incredible. And then the Porta Piers, great gate he designed. And then there's a Palazzo Farnese, completed by Michelangelo for his patron and friend, Pope Paul III. And of course, this is a fantastic building because it's established as a prototype for the kind of contemporary Renaissance Palazzo. But there was one building above all which would satisfy his lifelong quest to create something truly divine. A work which would guarantee his place in posterity on this earth and in heaven too. Michelangelo was asked to take over the design of St. Peter's, the spiritual home of the Roman Catholic Church. I want it to be seen as independent and incorruptible. I wanted an outward sign to myself and others of my inner resolve to move closer to faith and the love of God. I vowed to myself that I would refuse all payment. Most of the time that Michael Ezra was working on St. Peter's, he was on his regular salary. So in fact, he was receiving about a thousand ducats a year, and that made him one of the highest paid architects that St. Peter's ever had. St. Peter's crowning glory would be a dome on a scale not seen in Rome since the Pantheon was built more than a thousand years before. Building a dome was one of the big engineering challenges because by its nature it wants to fall down. And here you see an early sketch by Michelangelo for St. Peter's. The dome is formed by a series of stone ribs and these are restrained by the great drum here and the outward thrust in a sense wants to spread itself out. So what Michelangelo does here is to have these great buttresses. This is a pair of columns and these occur around the drum below the rib. So that is a, is a system he used, a very advanced system of, of, of engineered construction, quite fascinating. The dome would take many years to build and time was running out for Michelangelo. 
In his final years, he wanted to ensure his family would achieve the aristocratic status he had always craved. His hopes rested on his nephew, Leonardo. My dear Leonardo, choose a wife who is noble and poor. Not to ennoble yourself, because it is known we are ancient citizens of Florence, but to have a companion worthy to bear our name. He was delighted when Leonardo married into one of Florence's oldest families. At last, he had a worthy heir. Michelangelo was now preparing for the end and how he would be remembered by history. He began to destroy drawings and poems he didn't think were good enough. He even attacked one of his last works of sculpture, the Florentine Pietà, which was intended for his own tomb. It's his most personal and moving work. Michelangelo himself is supporting the dead Christ, the divine artist and the savior, united for eternity. Tell me that I was not greedy, that I was never jealous of others. I praised them. Even Raphael. Leonardo. And that in all my works, I was devoted only to the greater glory and love and beauty of your divine creation, O Lord. Have mercy on my soul. Michelangelo died on the 18th of February, 1564. He was almost 89. A mere mortal once, divine though born to be. Short time on earth, but heaven's forever mine. Rapturous change, when even death's benign. Deadly to many, but new life to me. The divine Michelangelo left a worldly fortune. 8,000 gold ducats, numerous bank accounts, and landed estates in Tuscany. By today's standards, he was a millionaire several times over, and the richest artist the world had ever known. His nephew Leonardo inherited everything. Michelangelo's final legacy to the world was completed 30 years after his death, the Great Dome of St. Peter's. By designing the most important building in Christendom, Michelangelo achieved the divine status he always sought. He was God's sculptor, God's painter, and now God's architect. From the Dome to the David, from the Pieta to the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo had created a unique vision of heaven on earth.